Hey everybody, this is American Idol Unaired. I am your host, Bennett Shearer. And as you know, lately we've been also doing some aired exceptions. And today's aired exception is our very special guest. Please welcome Mark Osborne. Mark, what's going on? How's it going? Uh, it's going great, man. I'm so excited to meet you. I was uh, I was such a fan of yours this season of Idol. And, um, you know, I know that so many people were as well and, and they loved watching you. But, you know, j- just in case they didn't catch a glimpse of you, I'd love if you could just reintroduce yourself to... American Idol fans. All right. Uh, I'm Mark Osborne. Uh, now I'm 27. I was 26 on the show, but 27 years old, Bedford County, Virginia. Uh, got to spend a little time on American Idol this year, a short stint, but I was there. Yes, you were. You <laughs> made quite an impact. And a uh, little fun fact here. I, I, I saw you and I wrote down top 10 and immediately I, I said, this guy, he's one of my faves and uh, it, was, it, was, it was a bit of a bummer to see you go but you know there's there as we're going to talk about today there are so many incredible people who you got to 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 witness in person uh and so not only did you get to be there and to experience being part of the competition but you know you were around so many incredible musicians and i imagine that just getting to 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 be in that room with so many people was really an amazing opportunity oh absolutely i mean that was probably my favorite part of the whole thing was getting there being in this room with, I mean, especially during Hollywood, you had a hundred and some people in this room, all of them super talented, most of them really great people, the ones I met anyways. And I mean, just making lifelong friends from the whole experience was awesome. Oh yeah. That's, that's a bond for life, no matter how far you make it, because, you know, we've talked to people who didn't make it past the audition, some made it to Hollywood, some made it into the live shows. And uh, no matter how far you go, you're all musicians, you're all chasing the same dream and despite it being a competition, this is all, it's all one goal, you know? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, as much of a competition as it is, I don't think many people, at least not outwardly, treated it as a competition. Most people were very friendly and just treated it as an experience to make connections, make lifelong friends, like I said. And uh, I mean, I'm still in contact with a lot of them. So, I mean, it, it was great. We did see your story that... Uh, your your mom wanted you to audition for the show as a as a birth it was a birthday present to her and I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about that story maybe a little more than we got to see on the show. Uh, yeah, mom sent me a text probably two or three days before the um, uh, the Zoom cattle call auditions were, and um, the funny thing was it was like two or three days also before her birthday. She didn't really say it was for her birthday, but it was definitely <laughs> implied. It was implied. So I was like, all right, I guess I'll have to do it. And um, the whole time, I mean, when I signed up from it, set, making my little account on there and everything, doing the Zoom audition, the whole time I was just like, just tell me no. So I could tell my mom, like, hey, I did it for your birthday. I didn't get too far, but I did it. And uh, what was supposed to be a 15 minute Zoom call turned into all day and then two trips to LA. So, <laughs> wow. Sounds like you were pretty shocked. I mean, I. I, I'm shocked to hear you say that you were surprised because, you know, I was blown away by your voice, but it sounds like you were not expecting to make it past that first round. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, they told me yes during the first, because during the cattle call auditions, you have lower level producers that you audition for first, and then you got to get up to the executive producer. And I mean, I was shocked just for the lower level producer to say, yeah, we're going to send you through to the, the winner's circle is what they called it. And I was like, oh no. I, I did not expect that. Now I have no clue what to do. Um, and I, I, I don't know. It was a great, great experience all around, even starting right off at the Zoom cattle calls. I mean, it was just a great experience the whole time. Now, in that first cattle call, since you weren't really expecting to make it, were you still nervous or were you like, ah, it's not going to happen, so no need to be nervous? Uh, I went into it saying, well, the thing is, I kind of was hoping it would happen a little bit. I kind of maybe expected it to happen um, because you got to expect it to happen for it to happen. So I was trying to treat it as like, yeah, I might make it through. I should make it through. We'll see. But at the same time, I wanted to, like, get it over with and tell my mom I did it once again. But, um, Yeah. yeah, I mean, I went into it not super nervous and then the second i got in front of the first producer i was like oh crap here it is all right and then sweat rolling down the face i mean it was uh it was pretty intense from the get-go for me yeah long day of waiting or was it a pretty quick process uh the cattle call was pretty quick to start off we had a 
I think it was like maybe 150 people in the little waiting room for that time frame. And I was like, oh, no, this is going to take quite a bit of time. And I mean, within five minutes, I was pulled in, did my thing. And then I was like I said, I was expecting it just to be like 15 minutes, maybe an hour or something like that. Then you kind of got to wait, hurry up and wait, get to this Zoom room. You're waiting for the 13 people in front of you to go to the executive producer. And then you're sitting there waiting for that. You get that done. And then once they tell you, yeah, you're going through the rest of the day is doing other interviews and sending in videos and all telling people about your story again to the story producers and all of this. And I mean, it turns into, I mean, for me, it was like a 10 hour day. Wow. That's yeah. a lot. I mean, between it's like, you've got to perform, then you've got to, you get, they have to, they have to get to know you as a person. And it sounds like it's such a complex process. I mean, you know, uh, I'm curious too about some of the songs you chose for that whole day. I think my first one was Keep Your Hands to Yourself by the Georgia Satellites. Uh, and then I did Midnight Special, uh, the CCR song. I did an old blues song from the 30s called Minglewood Blues. Um, that was by Cannon the Jug Stompers. And uh, I think those were the three I did. I just kept cycling through them. And I may have done something else, but I can't remember. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting kind of curious because I, I feel like I do want to sidetrack a little bit from the actual American Idol process. And you have such an interesting fusion of song choices and artists and influences. So first of all, when did you even get into music? Because I think I'd love to know more about that background. Uh, well, when I was a kid, uh, I grew up kind of in the early 2000s listening to a lot of stuff like Creed and Pearl Jam. And I would just like sing along with that. And I think that's that might be where I get a little bit of the raspy, growly stuff from. But um, I grew up singing that. And I always knew I could kind of sing. Uh, never tried to play an instrument until my mom got me a bass for Christmas one year. And I started fiddling around on that. And a lot of my buddies were playing guitar. And I went to my mom and I was like, hey, uh, do you think maybe you could get me a guitar? I kind of want to learn that. And she's like, there's been a guitar in the closet since you were born. And I was like, oh, that would have been awesome to know earlier. Wow. Uh, <laughs> so like I said, in the um, in what aired, I grabbed her guitar, put some strings on it. And I just had a little chord book and read off the chord book and taught myself. It must have been surreal, by the way, having... Uh having those producers in your house filming, you know, we got to meet your parents and that was a very moving story. So, uh, and I don't, I don't know how much all over the place my questions are in terms of the, the actual step-by-step -step process, but at what point from making it past that first round of auditions in the cattle call, did you have that filming going on in your house? Uh, that was probably, that was before the Nashville auditions because I uh -huh. was the LA auditions. Uh -huh. So that, that would have been really early November. I think so it was maybe three weeks after I auditioned mm -hmm. and I, I got an email and they were like, Hey, we're going to come here next week. Wow. I was like, awesome. That's, that's great. What is that like to just have casually just people with cameras and lights and, and the, probably the boom mics all over the place? Like surreal. I bet. I, I mean, for me, it wasn't that bad because I'd gotten used to the cameras during the LA auditions. Right. That was the big, big day for me being in front of all those cameras. And then they came here and my parents were freaking out. They were like, Oh no, do I look okay? How am I supposed to act on camera? I was like, just be y'all. It's okay. I was like, it's not that bad. Once you get the first mm -hmm. hour, two hours out of the way in front of the cameras, it's mm -hmm. all good. And they handled it pretty well. But for me, it was easy peasy. Sure. Yeah. Well, again, I may have gotten a little bit sidetracked because I'm just getting so curious here, but it sounds like the order is after that cattle call before they necessarily, you know, because how we see it on TV isn't always how it's it's done in order. But you uh, go to the judges in uh, L.A., you said, right? And then mm -hmm. afterwards they film it with your parents. So you get to L.A. and uh, what's that like? I know it's probably at several days before you're actually getting to the judges. From the start, it was a crazy experience for me because I've never flown. So my first flight <laughs> was to Chicago O'Hare and then from Chicago to L.A. And that's a that's a big difference from Bedford County, Virginia. So I got there. Uh, I mean, yeah, you get there. You you just kind of get settled in your hotel room, uh, do a couple Zoom calls with the producers, get ready for what all's going to happen. You get COVID tested, all of that. And then you start off with what they call day zero, which I've listened to your podcast. Yeah. I know a few people have talked about that. And day zero is kind of just straight filming. The judges aren't there. And if they are, they're out 
drinking or going at a ball game or doing something. I don't know what they're doing, but um, <laughs> yeah, you, you just do a lot of film and a lot of B-roll, a lot of interviews, um, did digital, which is, you know, going up there doing your social media stuff. They give you a phone, you take some pictures, they do like boomerangs and all that with you. And um, then day one started, I was day two. So day one started and I pretty much just had the day off. I just had to be down there at like 12 o'clock for a little bit of film. And that's when they introduced the platinum ticket. And then they were like, you're good. You can go up to your room, but you're on call if we need you, like mm -hmm. come back. So then I just got to explore LA for a day. And then finally day two. So I'd been there for what, three nights and two full days. And then day two, I finally got to go in front of the judges. Day two was like, I got there and they were like, well, today, you know, you're going to audition. This is your number. Uh, I think I was like, I want to say I was 13th. Lucky number 13, because I think I made a joke about that. So I was like yeah. 13th in order. And uh, they were like, yeah, now we're going to get you to do this B-roll of you like sitting in the holding room, playing your guitar. You're going to do one of these staged conversations. Now we're going to get you over here walking up these steps. Now we're going to get you walking into the hotel. And I was like, y'all couldn't have done this yesterday when I didn't have to audition. <laughs> but um, yeah, that was the big day for me. And then right after you audition, if you get the gold ticket, it's just all night from after that. I got to imagine as, as shocking as you, as it was for you, at least to get through the first round to get this far. And now you are really here in front of the judges. You've got the American Idol sign behind you. You're walking into that room. Is the, is your heart just pounding like crazy? I mean, it, it just must be insane. It was pretty intense, but I did tell myself, I was like, you know, I'm, I'm more of a alt country blues guy. I was like, I love the three judges, but they're not really, anybody that I listen to on a regular basis. I mean, Lionel Richie, I'd listen to a lot more than the other two. Uh, no offense, Luke and Katie, but um, no, I mean, it, I told myself before I went in there, I was like, I've got friends that are some of my best friends that I kind of look up to more than these three. So I was trying to calm myself down with that. It didn't work. Um, but I walked in and I just had a conversation with them. They're really nice. They're all genuine people. And uh, just had a conversation with him for the longest time. I wasn't nervous at all. And then the second I strummed that first chord, I blacked out. Mm -hmm. I was good up until then. And I strummed the first chord and I was done. You got to see me kick off the song, but they didn't do any of the chatting beforehand. If they just uh -huh. showed that, then I wouldn't have been nearly as nervous. Right. <laughs> it was right when I started. I was like, now I'm playing music for three of the most famous people in music. And this is crazy. I don't know how much was shown versus cut because even a even a five minute clip that we got to see, I'm sure is is maybe only half of what actually went down. You probably in there 10, 15 minutes, I'm guessing. I was actually one of the quicker ones that day. A lot of people were in there for 10, 15 minutes. I was probably in there for eight tops. But they the first three minutes I was in there, it was a lot of talking and talking about, you know, oh, I went to this college. I went to uh, East Tennessee State, majored in bluegrass. Luke Bryan loved that. Um, and so we were talking a little bit about that. And then all they showed was just me kicking off the song. They actually, one of my favorite parts that happened, they didn't show this, but on the way out, I told them that I, you know, dropped out of two colleges before I auditioned. And then on the way out, Luke Bryan was like, well, you got a degree in American Idol. And I turned back around and held my ticket up. And I was like, and that's the only one I need. And I walked uh, out and I was like, man, I wish they would have showed that, but it didn't really fit the story. Cause they didn't talk about the me dropping out of two colleges, but sure it's such a pleasure to watch something different, you know? Um, and I think that's probably what the judges saw in you. And I think that that must have felt really awesome to to know that you were there and you were bringing something unique. Yeah, I mean, definitely. I, I told all of the producers when I was doing the interviews up until I auditioned, I was like, I just want them to see that I'm not trying to be anything else. This is me. Uh, if I get told no, I'd rather be told no as me than no as somebody else acting like somebody else. So, I was like, I'm just going to go in there and try to be authentic. And then when Katie Perry said it's just authentic, I think I almost fell to the floor. Um, I, that's one of the things I do remember while I was blacking yeah. out and then right. getting to see that on the uh, part that they aired. I mean, that was that was great because that's all I want to be. I mean, oh, yeah. I think I said there's no use in doing it any other way when she said that. Oh, and no. I mean, that's that's all I've ever wanted to be is just myself. So that was it was nice to be appreciated for just being myself. Of course. Yeah. And you you did say like you just finished the song and you're like, y'all know this is nerve wracking, right? And I loved seeing just that genuine reaction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, a lot of people back home have asked me if they like the producers told me to say that or anything. And I was like, no, yeah. absolutely not. I, I got done with that. And I thought I wasn't going to make it. 
Mm. I was singing and I was like, this is not my best. If you listen to it, I actually slow the song down just a little bit because there was a lot of shakiness in my voice. So I was trying to pull that shakiness as being vibrato because I was so nervous. So I slowed the song down to match the shakiness. And then when I got done, I mean, I think when I hit the chorus the whole time, I was thinking, what song am I singing next and how am I saving my ass right now? Uh-huh. Because I thought I was I thought I was done. So right when I got done, I was just like, you guys know this is nerve wracking, right? Because yeah. I was freaking out. Wow. No, it, it comes across, you know, because I think that that's what's so interesting about reality TV is that no matter what tricks they can pull and a lot of people wonder like how much is staged and producers can do whatever they want, but you can always tell when something is authentic. And so Mm -hmm. it's, that's why it's like, that's why we root for people like that, like you who walk into a room and we know right then and there, this person has real star quality as a musician. And they also have that genuine personality, which we know that's who they are. We got that Mm -hmm. from your story. We got that from your performance and we got that from the reaction, which, you know, just shows uh, we, we love that humble side of you. It's just like, it's great to see that, you know, you're not trying to walk in there and just pull off like, oh, this is easy, you know, because it's not. You're on American Idol. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I mean, th- thank you for that, by the way. I mean, that, that's a great compliment. But I, I think the same thing can be said about Noah, which is why Noah, I think, just went so far and won the yeah. whole thing. Because, I mean, Noah, you can just see that every time he's on camera. He's just genuine and he's just just in awe the whole time he he had no clue he was going to go that far and i mean you can see that authenticity in him and i think that's what people want people want authenticity and they, they don't want anybody to put on an act and i think that's why he went so far and i think that's why a few people liked me a lot of people liked you i think a lot of people like noah and let's talk about noah for a second because i i think that he maybe brought something to the show that we haven't had in a long time. And I don't know how much you've watched the show before, but if you think about Carrie Underwood, it's basically Carrie Underwood's story. And she, I don't know, I don't know if you watched this season, maybe the rest since you got off the show. Oh no. Yeah. I definitely kept up with it. I recorded every episode because yeah. I mean, I just had so many friends. I had to keep up with them. You know? Yeah. And Carrie Underwood mentored. And she's like, she, she basically said that like this show is for like, it, this is what this did for me. This is what it's doing for Noah. And she got emotional. And I think she was spot on because I mean, like the fact that his friend Arthur like mm-hmm. told him, like told him, I'm I'm signing you up for this, buddy. Like, and then to see that, talk about another genuine moment, right? Like that was yeah. one of those things where you just watch it and you're like, this has to be real, and you root for him. And and I, I remember watching that. I think I think if I remember correctly, I could be wrong. He may have been the very first person they showed this season. I could be wrong. Yes, yes, he was the because I made that comment when he won. I was like, he was the first one they showed, and he's the last one on stage. So yeah, good. For him, I mean, he was the bookends. Yeah, no. So it just goes to show you that if you walk in the door and you come in there as yourself and you don't assume anything, but you're just completely authentic and you have just a raw voice, you can walk out that door a star. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, one of my favorite moments of him this season was during the duet round. And I believe it was him and Olivia. And there was a song there. They were looking at something and she had to show him what an F chord was. Oh yeah. And on his guitar. And I mean, I, that just hit me. Cause I was like, this dude really, ha- I mean, he has no clue how good he is. He has no clue what he's doing when he figures it out. He's going to be awesome. Cause I mean, he's got all the tone in the world and he's going to blow up. I think. Yeah. By the way, I don't think we really got to know her, but that's Olivia Faye you're talking about. Yeah. Who is his duet partner? Yes. And I think we we saw her because she was with Noah, but she wasn't aired as far as auditions go or any of the other rounds. But they did show her with Noah, I think. Yeah. Yeah. She she was in my line. So I think that was who was with Noah. I remember her pretty well. Okay. Uh, my line at Hollywood Week. So I got yeah. to know her a little bit. And she I mean, they didn't show much of her, but she was a good one, too. Yeah. By the way, did you get a chance to really know anybody when you were in L.A. filming the auditions or was it not really till Hollywood Week that you started really meeting people? Uh, really, because my time in Hollywood was so short. Um, really, most of the friends I made was during the auditions. Uh, Elliot Greer, me and him call each other about once a week, so we're pretty tight. Um, uh, Mike Parker and I, actually, we have mutual friends because he grew up in Northern Virginia and I went to college in Northern Virginia. And I went to college with a couple of his high school buddies. So we were like sitting out in the holding room just talking. And all of a sudden we were like, well, I know that guy. And he's like, I know that guy. And oh, we, wow. you know, hit it off. And um, Nicolina got to talk with her for a little bit. She's a sweetheart, very genuine. So, I mean, most of my friends I made were during the L.A. auditions. 
I didn't realize really until I started this podcast just how thorough of a process the auditions are. I, I always thought that it wasn't until Hollywood Week where you really got to bond with people. And of course, that's when everybody all comes together. But they used to do, I think, like seven or eight cities on the road. But now that they've cut it down to three, you really are meeting a lot of the contestants all at once in your audition city. And then you meet more when you get to Hollywood, of course. Uh, speaking of which, you get to Hollywood again in December for Hollywood Week. And uh, what's that like to be back in L.A. this time in this beautiful Orpheum Theater, tons of other musicians, and uh, it's go time? Oh, I, it was it was awesome, first of all. I mean, just getting to be around all of those musicians all in this one place. And, I mean, everybody's there for a reason. Everybody got a golden ticket. So you know everybody's good around you. So that part was just fantastic. Um, and then... I, for me, I guess I just got so used to the cameras that I was more nervous about playing and singing than I was about being on film, which blew my mind because the first time around I was fine with the singing and then until I got in there and then, it, you know, blacked out. But, you know, it, for me, it was just like I was almost like in this let's get the stuff done kind of a work mindset. And they were like, Mark, you're going to do this interview with Seacrest for a second. And then you're going to go over here and do this interview. And I was like, all right, let's go. So, I mean, for me, it was kind of fast paced. Uh, got to, I, I wasn't freaking out too much. Let's just mm -hmm. say that I'm and, until I got on stage again and then freaked out a little bit there. But it was it was just a awesome experience to be around all of those people and then be meeting si Ryan Seacrest and being in front of all those cameras again. And just I was just rolling. I was in the in the right mindset. And I was like, let's get this stuff done. Let's knock it out. Let's go. Must be wild for Seacrest because he has been there the longest of any of them. Only other people that have probably been there that long are the crew members. So for him, this machine is just so well oiled that it's like, okay, I've got to talk to this person, that person. He's just like a master, I'm sure, at the interviewing process. That man, he deserves every penny he makes. I will say that <laughs> much because he, I mean, he would interview one person and he'd be like, all right, who's next? He'd fist bump you. Nice to meet you. He'd have a little talk right. with you. All right, where are you from? You know, what kind of stuff do you do? You know, what kind of work do you do? What kind of songs do you sing? This, that, and the other. All right, let's sit down right here. Let's knock it out. And I mean, that's just how he was. I don't I don't know if the man took a breath in. He was just talking, getting the stuff done. Yeah. <laughs> On top of all his other jobs that he's got, because he's probably leaving Idol, going to do something else in New York. or Yeah, I, uh, one of my biggest regrets from Idol is when I'm, I knew I was going to meet Seacrest um, when we went to the Orpheum. And I was like, the first thing I want to ask him is, when do you sleep? Yeah, <laughs> because you do so much stuff. I have no clue when you sleep. Do you just sleep for like three hours on a flight? Is that it? Like, I don't know, man. Right. It sounds like Hollywood week. I mean, uh, there's there's some stuff that goes into it before filming begins. Is there kind of uh, is there kind of a day zero there as well? Or is it more like a quicker let's get you on camera thing? Yes, there is a day zero kind of esque thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you got to do the um, the mentors. We had to. So we had Lauren Elena. And we had to go up there and do that. I think that was just one day by itself. I may be remembering it wrong, but I think that was just kind of one day by itself. And then you're going and doing other B-roll stuff. And then once the day hits for everybody to go to the Orpheum, everybody goes to the Orpheum. And if you're doing interviews, you're doing it there. You're not doing it in the hotel. You're not having a holding room or anything like that. So th I guess that would be considered day zero because nobody's up there. But um, yeah, I mean, I was only there for the night we got there the mentors coming in at the hotel and then one day at the Orpheum and I was out. So I was there for like three nights. Any moments from Lauren Elena? I don't know if you had the chance to speak with her or not, but nothing on camera. I just mm -hmm. got to talk with her a little bit and um, she took a selfie with everybody uh, and she laughed about mine because I guess the way I leaned back, there was a plant <laughs> behind me and it looked like it was growing out of my head That's and funny. she laughed and almost fell into my lap. And I was like, <laughs> can somebody get her <laughs> it's oh like I don't, I don't know if like i'm allowed to be like here you go you know oh my god but um no i mean she was she was a sweetheart she complimented the mustache so you know i like her the mustache and the cash <laughs> says Mr. absolutely that must have been that must have been fun to like get do that close up with him in the audition oh yeah yeah i, I think if you watch it and I just rewatched it before we did this interview, so Me I could kind of <laughs> yeah. refresh my memory. Yes. And if you if you watch it when uh, when he comes up, I'm just like, what are we doing? My eyes are wide, and then he comes up and he's like, starts rubbing his mustache, and then I look over and I'm like, oh, and then look back into the camera because I had no clue what was going on. And like I said, Lionel is like my favorite of the judges that I would listen to more regularly than the other two. So that was as he was walking up to me, I was like, oh god, this is crazy and awesome and i love every second of it and you're a sweet man and thank you for this wonderful moment 
You know, Lionel and all of the judges, but I, I think, and, and part of it might be that they've been there so long, but they are so, in my opinion, so into their job and so genuinely passionate about it. And you can tell, like, they, they really care. And I love the way that, like, sometimes Lionel, like, not only does he get up and, and do a close-up with the mustaches, but he, like, you'll see sometimes he'll get up and as he's critiquing, if he's really passionate, he'll walk around and la sort of do a lap around the judge's table and, and just the way that he... He gets so enthusiastic and he he really cares about you guys and so do Katie and Luke like they all they all make really great TV moments and it's it's not just about entertainment but it comes from a place of really caring about you guys and it's very well oiled for them as well. Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, just the way that they feed off of each other is great. Uh, like you said, Lionel's the one up and running around usually, and I noticed that watching all the other auditions, he's usually the first one to get up and go say something to somebody or go hug somebody, which was kind of a no, no. We weren't, we were told not to go up to them because of COVID and all that. So, and um, he would come up to us. And I think that made a lot of people's experience great. Um, like I said, they feed off of each other. They're just all so nice, all so genuine. They try to make you not nervous and, and they just try to make you feel kind of at home around them. They know that they're superstars. So they're trying to calm you down a little bit and they actually do care. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, when it is when it is time to actually get going with the genre challenge, you actually were not aired your performance. It was just they they showed the results. So if anything, I mean, I know that, that you're an aired exception, but technically when it comes to Hollywood Week, you were not aired. So we got to hear what you sang. I want to hear how that went. I sang Minglewood Blues, the one that I did uh, during the cattle call. And I kind of sort of knew what I was doing. Um, I went into it and I said, you know, this is one of my favorite songs to sing. I know it's probably not what they're looking for. It's very bluesy, very gravelly, and I'm in a country line. And I was like, they're probably going to look at this and be like, is he country? And um, I sang that. I got a standing ovation from most of the people in the crowd. I heard a few hoops and hollers when I started kicking it off because they didn't expect that voice to come out of me. <laughs> uh, and I, when I got done, I looked down. The judges were still sitting down clapping. And I was like, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. But um, I mean, I think that was my big thing was probably just it was it wasn't necessarily what they were looking for. But I told myself, I want to do this. Once I get done with this, I'll jump on the bandwagon. But I just want to do this song. This is one of my favorite songs. And if y'all send me through on that, then this is the show for me. And if you don't, then I'll go home a happy man. It all goes back to authenticity because it's the genre challenge. You're in a country line and you could have said, well, you know, I need to make it more mainstream. I need to countrify my performance. But I think that that's the mark of a true artist to say, I don't need to change who I am. And it almost was like, I think one theory is that they're challenging you to fit into the genre. But another way of looking at it is you should be challenging yourself to not have to conform if it's not something that is really who you are. I mean, you have elements of country, right? But you're not strictly a more mainstream country artist. I mean, we talked about Noah, maybe that's more of his thing and that's great. That's okay. We have maybe a similar tone in your voice, some grit there and, and the story going on, but you're different artists and that artistic integrity, I think is what's so important. Yeah. Like I said, I mean, for me, it was just, it was a song that I couldn't pick what song I was going to do. I was going back and forth and I finally was just like, look, I'm going to do this song because this is a song I do at all of my shows. Uh, most people like it. Some people don't. We'll find out. But like I said about the auditions, like if I go home being myself, that's better than me going home trying to sing a pop country song. And I'm not a big pop country guy, you know, so I, I was proud of myself for going home the way I did and staying true to myself. Sure. Uh, from your perspective, were there any performances you saw, whether they were in your line or any others that you got to see? I'm not sure how many you got to watch from other lines throughout the day that were some standouts for you. There, there were a few right at the beginning in a, in a pop line. And I can't remember. Um, somebody did uh, an Adele song. And I mean, I think she was the first one of the, of the genre challenge. And I can't remember, but I mean, she just set the tone right away. She just crushed it. And everybody was like, Oh, we're here. We're here. And we got to pick our game up. Um, but I didn't really get it. Like I said, I didn't really get a chance to go around and catch people's names. I was the fifth line too. And I was the first one in the fifth line. Maybe, well, maybe for me, uh, the younger country line, uh, so like Dakota and Riley, Riley from Wattle, they all stood out to me, the, the whole line. I think it was five of them, and I think they sent two of them home, and I was shocked at that because I thought all five of them were great. And um, that was probably my favorite performances. It was just five in a row of just killer performances. And um, 
I think our whole line was very sad when they sent anybody home from that line. So the young country people, they, they represented well. How quickly after uh, you got eliminated did you end up going home, like physically leaving? The next morning. I mean, I got eliminated. Uh, luckily, a friend of mine that I grew up with was actually in L.A. that night. So I got eliminated and I was like, hey, let's go explore L.A. for the one night. And uh, the next morning, I mean, 10 o'clock, I was on a bus going to the airport hopping on a plane at like 12 and going home. What was going through your mind initially? Were you just happy to have the experience? Were you also sad? Was it bittersweet? It, it was a bittersweet kind of thing. Cause I mean, the whole time I was just trying to take the experience in and I was trying to enjoy it. And I really did enjoy every second I was there. And then I, I don't know, like I said, I knew that what I was doing, they may not like, and I kind of knew what I was doing. But still being told no, that part sucks. Yeah. And then, I mean, 30 minutes after you're back in the hotel and you're just like, hey, I've got a night to like go see all of my friends that I've made and just tell them bye and like go explore the town for a little bit. And I mean, I, I wasn't heartbroken uh, by any stretch, but um, it was it still sucks right in that split moment when you get told no as you're walking off that stage. That part's a little rough. I think you still made your mark, no pun intended. You know, like <laughs> when you think about all the things you took away from it, I mean, uh, obviously fulfilling your mom's birthday wish in the first place and then just surprising yourself by making it through all those rounds and, and, and getting through the performances, getting to go to L.A. for the first time, going on a plane for the first time. I mean, I think there's probably so many things that you probably took away from the whole experience where at the end of the day, you just look back on it and you're like, Psh, yeah, I'm just so glad I even got to do it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean – just the whole experience itself is great to look back on. I still, some days I catch myself just looking back and remembering certain things. And I mean, it puts a smile on my face, but I mean, even afterwards where I did get aired for that audition, I mean, I've got to do, uh, sing the national anthem at our, um, local baseball teams game. I got to do that. I, you know, did an interview with the news, which was crazy to me. You know, I'm on a podcast for the first time, which wow. is crazy to me, you know, so, I mean, it's it's been a lot of cool experiences just checking stuff off the list that I'm yeah. doing. And, I mean, the, the whole thing definitely is something that I'm proud I did and proud of myself for how I did it and, and just grateful, grateful. Yeah. And then on top of that, you also made so many great friends. And I think that's great that you guys still keep in touch. And it's it's awesome following you guys online and just seeing that everybody is so close and so supportive as well just the community that gets built from it. I mean, I think there's still a group chat. I can't do it because I'm from the boonies and I have an Android. So <laughs> I can't join that iPhone group chat, but uh -huh. I think there's still a group chat out there with probably a hundred to 200 people on it that just all text back and forth. I mean, that, that part is just awesome to me that everybody just stays kind of together and uh, keeps in touch. I mean, that's, that's the amazing part of this is you meet so many great people and you get to keep in touch with these people. Friends for life. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, Mark, I mean, it, it was great to hear about your experience. And I, I definitely want to hear before we head off here, like about what is next for you and what you're looking forward to, um, whether it's because of American Idol or just things that you're going to be up to just moving forward with your music. Uh, well, mu moving forward with the music, uh, I'm taking a little hiatus because this has been just a huge experience for me. Like I said, you know, a guy from the boonies in Bedford County, all of a sudden my notifications are blowing up on every social yeah. media I have. <laughs> So I've been decompressing, but the past couple of days I've gotten back into writing. I haven't wrote in a long time, so I'm getting back into the writing. So I'm ready to start getting back out there. Nothing planned yet, but something soon. I will say that much. Well, I definitely want to give you a chance in that case to plug your socials and let people know where they can keep in touch with you, follow you so that they know when something's coming up from you. Well, the best way to keep in touch with me is on Instagram at Mark Osborne Music. You can find me on Facebook, too. Um... I have a Twitter, rarely use it, but mo the best possible way to keep up with me is Instagram. Definitely go to Instagram and give me a follow on that, and I will stay in touch with you for sure. Awesome. That's Mark Osborne Music, yeah? Uh-huh. Mark Osborne Music. Awesome. And you can follow us on Instagram or TikTok at Idle Unaired Podcast to keep up with everything related to this show. If you're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you're listening, make sure that you subscribe, rate, leave a review. You can also watch these interviews on YouTube. Wherever you're getting this show, guys, thank you so much for listening or watching. This has been American Idol Unaired, Aired Exceptions.